Hi everyone, we're going to give this a try. Um, there were some technical difficulties, one of them my fault, one of them just a good old fashioned computer issue. Um, this morning while we were um, attempting to record the lecture in class, so I am re-recording it now um, in hopes to get it out soon for those of us that weren't able to come that uh, made the choice to stay home for their safety and well-being. I respect that and hopefully you'll have a chance to watch this video now. We are going to um, work through just a few problems, talk a little bit about our, have a focus on our thinking while we solve these problems um, in order to prepare us for our test on Friday. The first problem that we uh, solved in class uh, is shown on the screen here. We're dealing with a train engineer that's observing an obstruction in their path. Uh, when we read this problem, let's pay attention to the pieces of information that we're given and let's go right ahead and uh, make a list of all the things as we're given them. So the engineer of the train observes a rock slide um, blocking the train's path 225 meters ahead. So that's going to be our initial or rather our final distance. That'll be x final. The engineer then immediately activates the brakes and the magnitude of the acceleration is 1.8 meters per second squared. So when we see that 1.8 meters per second squared, what that's really telling us is that if we assume the train is moving in the positive direction, our acceleration is minus 1.8 meters per second per second. So we're told the final position is 225. Our acceleration is a negative 1.8 because we know that we're slowing to a stop. And then the last bit of information that we're told is that the total time is 127, sorry, 12.7 <laughs> seconds. So that would be the time that it takes for this train to slow down. The last thing that we need to be sure that we keep track of in order to start a solution for this problem is what we're asked. Always be sure that we know what we're looking for. What was the speed of the train when it reached the rock slide? That means that we are looking for V final. Okay, so now we're going to switch over to a blank screen. Uh, if you want to, you can pull up this slide. This and the other problem that we solved were the last two slides on the lecture slides that have already been posted. There was no new uh, lecture slide. So you can follow along with this problem in a separate window if you want. Um, so let's work with this a little bit. Let's turn this off. Good. Whoops. You see I was testing my my writing. Pardon me. Let's, let's erase this from the screen. Whoops. <laughs> I'm doing my best, folks. This is not typically software I use for capture, so there's a bit of a learning curve. Okay. So let's make a list of the things we were told. We were told um, our x final was 225 meters. We can assume that our x initial was 0 meters. We started at 0 and we're uh, moving right along. We are told the acceleration was negative 1.8 meters per second per second. And we're told our time was 12.7 seconds. So I find that it's useful to make a little list like this while we're solving a problem to keep track of what we know. And also you'll see the next thing I write to keep track of what we're looking for. V final, that does looks more like an S in this sketching program. It's a bit more artistic than what I'm used to using. VF is equal to question mark. All the rest of the pens and stuff were too faint. This was the darkest one, but it's got this slant to it. Anyway, I'm not complaining. We want to know what V final is. Well, let's start by looking at the equations that we have for accelerated motion. This is one dimensional accelerated motion, so we have three equations that we can use. The first one that's useful to us is V final equals V initial plus the acceleration times time. Now we have the time. We have the time, that's nice. We have the acceleration, but we don't have the initial, so that's not exactly useful. There's another equation that we have that has v final, v final squared equals uh, v initial squared plus 2 times the acceleration times delta x. Also not quite useful, 
because we don't know v initial. So what we have to do here is instead of realizing, okay, I'm at a roadblock and I have no formulas and I need to find some new formula that has these pieces in it, right? We want a formula that has all this stuff that looks for VF, but we don't have one. So the other formula that we're free to use for accelerated motion is this formula, x final equals x initial plus vi times t plus one half a t squared. Now again, alone, this formula does not have all the pieces that we want, namely it's missing vf, right? We don't have our final velocity. What we're going to do is we're going to combine these two formulas. We want to find the final velocity, so we're going to, for this initial velocity, put in the following. What we're going to do is we're going to take this equation here, and we're going to rearrange it to say, okay, vi is equal to vf plus the acceleration, oh, excuse me, minus the acceleration times time. I was, my gut was right. Minus the acceleration times time. I should be following my notes instead. I'm just looking at the screen. Minus the acceleration time. I'm, I'm moving this term here over algebraically. Then this vi can go in here and I get a new expression. I'm going to pause while I erase because this program doesn't have multiple pages like I'm used to. Okay, we're back. I just did some erasing and moved those two useful equations up to the top of the screen. So again, this second equation here comes from rearranging that first equation in terms of vi, and we're going to put it in this spot now. So now that top equation comes, becomes x final equals x initial plus vf minus at times t plus one half at squared. Right, I've just substituted in for vi up here this entire expression to get this last equation down here. Now we can simplify this just a little bit. x final equals x initial plus vf times t, right, I'm distributing the t through, minus a t squared plus one half a t squared, which ultimately gives me this expression x final is equal to x initial plus v final times t minus one half a t squared. Now this last expression is not one of those three expressions that we started class with that, that we've been talking about in class for the last few days that I've said things like these are the only equations that you need. This equation is not one of those equations. What I hope we realize is it came from two of those equations in order to answer a very specific question for a very specific problem. The danger in what we can find in terms of solutions to these physics problems, and we'll see it again when we talk next about a two-dimensional motion, a projectile motion problem, is that we can find many solutions that say, well, I start with this relationship or here is this special case formula. And that's exactly what those are, special cases. They only work for that particular question. And while I'm not saying that those are invalid for those particular questions, it's very easy to over apply them and to try to get them to fit a different scenario. And that's where we get wrong answers. So this is not a new expression. This is a result of our fundamental formulas being manipulated in such a way to solve for a thing that we're interested in, right? We want to know what is the final velocity. We want to find the final speed. We were only told things like the initial position is zero. Well, we assume that. We were told the final position, right, is 225 meters down the track we were told the acceleration is minus 1.8 meter per second squared and we were told that the time is 12.7 seconds. So because of what we were told and because of the question that's asked this formula is now useful for us because we manipulated the formulas that are always true to have the pieces that we need. I want to make sure that I'm stressing that importance that it's not um, 
it's not a new formula it's not an additional formula we only ever need those three for accelerated motion we can get the answer that we want by manipulating them a little bit so solving for this when you solve 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 let's see how can I uh, move this around oops that's not the right thing there we go when I am solving I want to uh, do a little bit of algebra put in these values that we had um, to get that the whoops not the final position but the final speed I thought I had my notes with me is I have it here when we solve for it we should get that the final speed is Oh, I'm not finding it. One second while I recalculate it. And we're back. The final speed you can recalculate to get 6.29 meters per second. And then you can also use this to go back to that formula that we started with um, to find VI in case you're curious. And as a, if we imagine we were those transportation safety board crash scene investigators we might be curious how fast was the train going as part of our investigation you can get something like 29.2 meters per second as an aside but this was the answer to the question that we were posed how fast are we going when we strike the rocks key here is we had to use the given equations and manipulate them in order to find the thing we're looking for we did that by doing a substitution really doing two equations, two unknowns. I'll pause while I set up and find all my notes for the second problem. Now, the next thing we did in class was we had a little bit of a discussion about certain special case formulas that you might see when you are solving projectile motion problems. So first we need to define a pretty simple problem, which is something like, um, let's say we have level ground so let's say we're on a flat field and we have some projectile that's launched from the ground with some initial speed VI at some angle theta above the ground. And of course its trajectory goes up into the air and then down and hits the ground here and we want to find what that final position is. Okay, so the question is knowing VI so we know that uh, we know the magnitude of VI and I think I gave numbers in class but we're gonna talk just in symbols here we know the magnitude of VI and we know that angle theta our question is what is XF that is to say knowing the initial launch speed and angle what is the distance downrange that we travel? Those of us that haven't done the pre-lab will appreciate thinking about this because this answers the question on the pre-lab basically. Now, when we know the initial conditions for the speed and the angle, and we are told the y coordinates, we aren't told explicitly, but I mean looking at the picture, we know, we also know that y initial that's supposed to be a Y. Let's make that look like a Y. We know that Y initial and Y final are both zero because we are on level ground. So on level ground, we're starting at zero and we end at zero. Now, if we want to think about, okay, what formulas do we use to find what we're looking for, let's bump this up a little bit. We want to know that final position. So in the x direction, when we're in free fall and we have two dimensional projectile motion, the only thing that's true in the x direction is the following relationship. x initial plus vx initial times time. Now for that projectile that we had, you know, a speed and an angle theta we know that we can talk about the x component vx initial and the y component 
there, v y initial using trig. So we can say that x final is equal to x initial, which in this case is zero. We're saying we're starting at the origin. vx initial would just be vi times cosine of theta times t. Now again, we don't know the time. Very often in these projectile motion problems, when we have motion in two dimensions, one with acceleration and one without, we'll utilize the fact that the time is the same in both dimensions. The object arrives and leaves at its various locations at the same moments in time. So we can find the time now by considering the y direction. So what's that going to look like? Well, if we think about, let me move this up here. In the y direction, we can state the following, that I can use the equation y final is y initial plus vy initial times t plus one half acceleration in the y direction t squared. Now let's put in some of the things we know for this particular problem. We have 0 equals 0, that's us starting and ending at the same location on level ground. vy is going to be v initial sine of theta, that's our initial y component from that little triangle we drew a moment ago, times t. And then I'm going to write here 1 half minus g t squared, because we're assuming we're on Earth. Let's simplify this a little bit. I've got these zeros here, that's nice. So I've got 0 is equal to vi sine of theta times t minus, I'm just going to move that minus sign up front, 1 half gt squared. Now if I look at this algebraically, I can divide both sides by t. So I divide this by t, and I divide all of these terms by t. And what that does, 0 divided by t is just 0. But over here I'm going to have these t's cancel, and here I'm going to have one of those t's go away. So that significantly reduces my equation's complexity to get the following relationship. Just to write it cleanly here, we're going to get back to blue. There we go. So I'm going to have 0 equals vi sine of theta minus 1 half gt. So now, well, let's see if I can get them both on the screen at the same time. There, we have this equation up here that has x final, what we're looking for, and t in it. And we have this equation here that has t in it as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve for t and insert that into our relationship. So that's going to look like the following. We can say that, I know it's a little bit clunky to watch me move this around, but from our first expression, we can say that um, here, let's do it this way. Let's say I've got t, let's utilize this expression. t is going to equal, just solving this around, we have 1 half g, so I've got 2 vi sine of theta over g. This tells me that the t in this formula up here, I can now use what I just solved for to input here for this t. I'm going to make that same substitution. So let's bring this formula on down. And we get here that, first I'll just rewrite it since it's not on the screen right now. So I've got x final was equal to x initial, which is 0, uh, plus the initial x velocity vi cosine of theta times t. So now I'm going to insert all of this in for t, which means I can write vi cosine theta times 2 vi sine theta over, whoops, not over 2, over g. This will tell me my final position. X final is equal to all this stuff. Now, there is a formula floating out there in the universe 
Some people call it the range formula. I've heard the word on the street, there's a range formula. Everything that we've done to get to this equation is specific to this problem, most notably specific to the scenario where on level ground, I start at y equals 0, I go up to a maximum value, and I come back down to y equals 0. That will, this formula will tell me x final. If you simplify this with some trig identities, you can combine cosine theta times sine of theta into sine of 2 theta or something like that. And maybe you play a game with whether the 2 is on the top or the bottom, whatever it is. Um, this is only useful in this particular set of circumstances to answer this particular question. The problem comes when I try to apply this for any different kind of question or any different kind of scenario and different givens, okay? If I instead asked, okay, how far down range is the object when it hits a target, like I shoot it with the same initial conditions, but now it hits a target that's three meters tall. So here's this target on some kind of stand. And this means that y final is equal to three meters. So now I want to know what this x final is. Maybe that was my question. So I don't let it go all the way to the ground. Well, all of the assumptions we made, most notably the one that made our algebra easiest, which was right here, if we have a new question, this equation here simply does not become this, right? Because I don't have 0 and 0, I have 2 or 3 meters and 0, which means I can't simplify all this work that I did down here to make this equation a little bit nicer. I cannot do. I have to solve a quadratic to find the time which means that the formula that's the result, whatever that sine of theta, cosine theta, whatever that nice looking formula, just simply doesn't work. Another thing that we may have done in the past is especially if you had physics in high school, usually this is, I don't wanna say stressed, but usually the questions that you're asked always allow you to do things like, let's draw a clean picture here. Again, if we had a scenario where here's our level ground and we started here and we went up to some maximum value and down. When we start and end on the ground that path is symmetric about that top point here where at the top it is true that at the top vy, sorry, not vf, vy is equal to 0. Let's erase all that. At the top, vy is equal to 0. That is true. There are times where that might be helpful, specifically if we're asked about how high does it go and what is the position. Well, I know one more thing. I know that I can put 0 in for vy. But if I'm not asked for that, if I'm asked for something like, well, what's it doing over here? What is this x final? Sometimes we were taught to find information about the top. Where does the top occur and double that distance, right? Find the time that it takes to get to the top and then double it. That's the time that it takes. That's true, but again, that's an artificial constraint that only locks us into thinking that we have to do that for every problem. The example I share in class is that it's like teaching someone to drive by only teaching them how to parallel park and then saying, okay, now go on a road trip and drive on the freeway. You know all the parts about the car. You know how to do that. Well, if you try to apply the rules and the techniques of parallel parking in the freeway, you're going to have a bad time, right? Instead, we teach driving the other way. We say these are the basic parts of the car. These are the basic maneuvers in a car. This is how you make the car function. And now, in this special context, follow these steps. So when we say turn the wheel, we don't have to learn what the wheel is. We already know what the wheel is, and we know what the wheel does. So I'm just going to turn it in a very specific way in order to maneuver my car to parallel park. I don't want us thinking that we have to solve every projectile motion problem by finding the stuff at the top. We didn't do that for 
the problem we did for the basketball problem. We didn't do that because we weren't asked. That's the problem we did on Monday. We weren't asked about what happens at the top. Let's let's work a problem here to make that point clear. So in this problem here, let's go to our next problem here. Okay, we've got a problem dealing with a golfer that is going to hit an approach shot with a given initial speed and a given initial angle and the ball lands on an elevated green 5.5 meters above the initial position. We're asked several things such as how much time passes so we want to know t. How far did the ball travel in the x direction? We want to know x final. And then we are asked these special special questions about what's the peak height and what was the speed of the ball at this instant. So what we are not going to do, you'll notice, those of us that have been shown this technique, and frankly, you might not realize it, but over apply the technique of find the time to the top and double it, find the position that happens at the top and double it. We're going to see that we're going to answer these first two questions by just starting with the formulas that we have for um, motion in the x and y direction no special cases. We're only going to start with those fundamental formulas to see that we can put in the right information to answer this question. So let's switch over to this screen, draw a quick picture, and get started on this problem. So I'll leave this, actually I'll leave this diagram up here. I'm going to make some changes to it to make it fit our problem. We are told that we have, let's erase that little top part, we are told that we have the case where we want our golf ball to land on the green five meters above, or it does land on the green five meters above where we shot the ball. So maybe the fairway looks like this to the green, right? That's a tricky green. Let's hope the green's not right there. <laughs> I'm not a golf course designer, right? Maybe it's on the edge of the green and then the green goes like that. Okay. So we want it to land right here where Y final is 5 meters. Y initial is on the ground. That's 0 meters. We were told information about the initial velocity. So I'll draw a little arrow here. We'll break this down. I just want to draw it there. Right? We were told the angle and we know the speed with which we hit the golf ball. The first question we want to answer is the time. And I specifically asked the question this way with time first because we're seeing a pattern that Again, we'll do in lab this week that you'll see in lots of problems like this. I want to make sure that that's still sort of on the screen. There we go. That's, that's kind of what we're doing there. Um, here I've explicitly asked for time. Often if we are given the <coughs> initial speed and the angle, which is really the x and y components, and we're given our y positions, like we know where we want to land or we know where we started and we're dropping down to the floor like in lab, we will always find the time in those instances using the y, the equations for acceleration in the y direction. If we're given other initial conditions we might be able to use the x, but here we're not able to do that, which is why I specifically asked that question first. So we want to find the time. Let's make a quick list of what we know. We know y initial is equal to 0. We know y final is equal to 5. We know our acceleration is equal to minus 9.8 meters per second per second. These are distances in meters, or excuse me, positions in meters. We are looking for the time, and we do know our initial velocities in both the x and y direction. Hopefully we're comfortable breaking this two-dimensional vector into components really quickly. Let's see what that looks like. Here is V initial is 28 point, let me find the numbers, 38.2, pardon me, 38.2 meters per second. And we are told that this angle is 50 degrees. So again, what we want to find is we want to find down here, we want to find Vx initial. Well, that's going to be 38.2 meters per second times cosine of 50, which is going to equal, I did it in class, let's see if I can find it, 24.55 meters per second. 
And then we also want to find, right, Vy. Vy would be this component right here. Pretend that's a perfectly drawn straight arrow. Right? It's the vertical component of that initial vector. So Vy initial is going to be 38.2 times sine of 50, which is going to equal 29.26. So that's just calculating what Vy initial is and Vx initial. One thing that can happen in these problems is, especially a case like this where my angle is anywhere near 35 to 55, um, those components aren't wildly different, right? Because we're closing in on 45 where the components are the same. So be sure we're keeping straight which is my x and which is my y. So. Uh, I'm going to move these off the screen. Hopefully on your page you can still see them. It'll be easier for you to track what we're doing if you're checking in with your work back and forth. In the y direction, when we're looking for time, the most useful thing, uh, the most useful equation when we have position and we have initial velocity is the equation y final equals y initial plus vy initial times t plus one half a t squared. Now again, this is not a new equation. This is the equation we've been using for the last three, four days of class. What we realize is we've got the information to put in to all the parameters in this equation to solve for what we want, namely time. Here our y final is 5.5 meters. I think I said erroneously, and I did this in class too, um, I said 5 meters, it's 5.5 meters. The problem states 5.5 meters, so I might have wrote that, written that down incorrectly, I apologize. 5.5 meters, that is our y final. Uh, get rid of this, there we go. Our y initial is zero. Now our vy initial, that is our 29.26 meters per second. I'm gonna drop the units so we don't have a lot of, a lot of information on the screen. Plus one half, negative 9.8, t squared. Hopefully I didn't cover up. There we go. Now, here I am putting in the numbers early, right? Normally I don't do this. I like to work in symbols, but I know some of us are more comfortable doing algebra with numbers. I don't know why that is. That's a personal choice, I suppose. Algebra was made for letters and symbols, um, but whatever. Well, let's not get off track. I'm putting in the numbers on purpose so we can see again here how the numbers look in this problem. Um, I've many times worked problems like these with symbols and then put numbers in at the end. One thing that I suggest is as you work with other students, you know, you talk to someone in class, say, what did you get for this? How did you do this? In lab, you might slide your paper across the table and say, I got this. The more you look at other people's work and realize, oh, they didn't put in numbers when I did, or they did this calculation and I just went ahead and did that calculation later. The more you see it different ways, the easier it is to understand the deep underlying patterns, such as we always start with one of these fundamental equations, and then we tweak it and put in the values to get the answer that we're looking for. All right, let's move along. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to write this equation this way. I'm going to put this uh, term out front, the t squared out front, and 1 half times 9.8 is 4.9. So I've got a negative sign there, negative 4.9 t squared plus... 29.26 times t minus 5.5. I need to solve for t. I have to do the quadratic formula. I have t and t squared in the same relationship, but I can set that expression equal to zero, which allows me to do the quadratic formula. A quick reminder on the quadratic formula, right? If we have zero equals a t squared plus b t plus c, then t is equal to the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2a. Now, do I expect you to have the quadratic formula memorized? My honest answer is, as a citizen of the modern world, yes. As someone even 
tangentially related to science as a major, which is everyone in this course. Yes, those of you that don't have science as a major, you take this as a major requirement. Well, guess what? You took the class with someone who believes that all citizens should know the quadratic formula. Basically, that means that while you were in middle school and high school, you were awake at least 20% of the time because you saw this all the time. And it's the same. It hasn't changed. Will I happily remind you of it when you need it? Absolutely. But we don't need to have it memorized. You can look it up. There's solvers online, etc. But come on, come on. Use that stuff. Remember when you were sitting in that algebra class? When am I ever going to use that? Now. Now is when you're going to use that. Okay, rant over. Let's make this fit this equation. So, oops, so let's make sure this is on the screen there. I'll adjust that a little bit. There we go. So now for our equation then, that means we're going to have the following. For our equation using the quadratic formula, we'll have that t is equal to the opposite of 29.26 plus or minus the square root of, here I will need a longer one here, 29.26 squared minus 4, now be careful with your minus signs, I've got 1 for my a coefficient, 4.9, and I've got 1 for my c coefficient, minus 5.5. .5. I've got both of them. i got to be sure they're both written down. All of that, the entire thing on the top, make sure we're dividing the entire thing by 2 times our a coefficient, minus 4.9. I'm going to pause and double check my calculation before we continue with the video. Okay, great. So calculating that out, um, we get, in this case, because we're starting on the ground and ending up a little bit higher, uh, we get two real answers. We get that t is either equal to, if you take the plus root, you get 0 0.194 seconds. And if you take the minus root, we get 5.77 seconds. Now looking back at our diagram, I'm just going to redraw it here. Here is our situation. This is our trajectory, like so. So here's our spot 5 meters above where we started. Obviously that height is the same here as well. So here is T1 and here is T2. So I can put little subscripts on that. We just had to have a little reality check. What do these numbers tell us about what we know about the trajectory of the ball? Nothing. Note that nothing in the formula here said this is the one that's correct. We had to use our understanding of, okay, when I golf, the ball goes up in the air and then lands on the green. I don't go through the ground and then land on the green while I'm going upward. Right? I land on the green while I'm going downward. T1, the ball is still moving upward towards the apex of its trajectory. T2 is when the ball is going down and it'll land on the green. To answer the second question, which is what's the final position, now we want to know, okay, on this diagram here, if this is xi equals 0, here is x final, and we want to know what that position is. That's simple enough to do, especially now that we have the time, because in the x direction for these types of problems, here I'll move this over here so that we can still see it, we only have one equation that we can use in the x direction, which is x final equals x initial plus vx, sometimes I write vx initial, sometimes I just write vx because there is no acceleration in the x direction. So times vx times t. So we can put here 0 plus, now be careful, here we need to use the x component of our velocity that we calculated earlier. So go back in your notes and you'll see that we calculated vx initial to be 24.55, not the 29.26 that we used when we calculated um, our time using the y direction. But we did calculate the time, 5.77 seconds. This gives us a x distance of 141 meters. I don't know off the top of my head what that is in yards. Give me just a second. So I just converted it. That's 154 yards. So depending on your game, you know, for a pro, 
they're probably taking something off of a nine iron for an average person that might be a seven iron six iron i don't know it's been a while since i played golf and even then it wasn't that good <laughs> so who knows but certainly a reasonable approach shot that a decent golfer can make onto a green from 150 yards away now our last question was how high does the ball go what is the height that the ball reaches on this trajectory and what's the speed of the ball at that point we're going to use some information that wasn't told in the problem but is true about that position in order to answer that question so what we want now is for again I'm just moving this off of the screen we want to know for the maximum height so again if we write out here here is our Oops, we don't want that. We want, we ended up up here, right? For our trajectory that goes like this, something like that. We want to know what this y max is. I'm going to check to make sure that's on the screen. Yep. So we want y max, this location right here. We are asked explicitly about this. I encourage you to only use that special case of at the top the y velocity is zero when we're asked about the top or we need to know something about the ball going to the top try not to over apply what is true that if we are from level ground to level ground zero to zero that the time is half it is double the time to the top all those little things that we might have learned in a previous class I really urge you to be cautious about it because it's very easy to over apply it. But now that we are asked about the time to the top, we know that at the top, Vy is equal to zero. That's the definition of what's happening at the top. So I can use our equations. Um, here it'll be most useful to use this equation, V final in the Y direction squared equals V initial in the Y direction squared plus 2 times the acceleration in the y direction y final minus y initial I'm doing this because it's important to realize that the times that we calculated before were the times for the whole path to get all the way from one side to the other we don't have that here we have a different time to the top we haven't calculated that time so the other expression that solves for y final so just as an aside right this expression y final equals y initial plus vy initial times t so far we have it we're looking for it we have it we have it uh we don't have t and furthermore there's a t squared over here so we don't have this particular t that's not the t that we solved for it's going to take a shorter time to get to the top and we don't want to solve for that so this equation here we've already done the algebra to get this equation by combining those first two equations to eliminate the need for time we know that our final y velocity is zero. We've already calculated our initial y velocity due to that initial 38.2 meters per second up at 50 degrees, right? We already know that y, v initial in the y direction is our 29.26 meters per second. Look back in your notes to see that we've already calculated that. Now I have to be careful with my minus sign, plus two times negative 9.8 times whoops, y final minus y initial. Our y initial is 0, so really I can just write this last bit as times y final, right? Because here I can make a note y initial is equal to 0. Moving this so that we can see it. Now we can just solve for We've got 2 times 9.8 times y final equals 29.26 squared, right? where I've taken the minus sign that's in this term, but since I've algebraically moved it to the other side, it becomes positive. So y final is, when you calculate that out, I get 43.7 meters. And then the other question that we were asked was, what's the speed at that point? Well, I know that my velocity at that point 
has only x velocity, so I know that my speed is equal to the x component of my velocity, which would be that 24.55 that we've solved for. So that last question didn't even need an equation. We needed to use our understanding that, look, here we, saw, we said that at that moment the y velocity is zero so I only have velocity in the x direction. We'll stop here. Problem solving wise we got a little bit farther than we did in class so hopefully even those in class might watch this the end of this video to see those last two parts of the question being solved. Uh, I will post this immediately to YouTube so those of us that weren't in class can watch it and uh, make sure that we stay caught up. Our exam, our test one for our first unit is on Friday. As you prepare, please ask me your questions. Reach out to me. Email me. Come to office hours today or tomorrow uh, virtually. I'm, I'm on them right now, but no one's, no one's checked in. I'm on my other monitor on Zoom, but no one's been here. Um, but if you have questions, reach out to me, even if it's not during office hours. Find a time where you can get my attention um, to make sure that we can answer all of your questions and prepare you for our test. Great work, everyone. Those of us that weren't there at lecture today, thanks for checking in to make sure you're keeping up. I really appreciate your hard work. Keep it up. Good work.